Okay, there we go. It blinked on and off, so I was making sure we're good. All right, good evening. I'm Reverend Steve Clegg. I'm the interim pastor at Second Baptist Church in St. Paul's, and this is our midweek Bible study. Uh, if you want to, be turning your Bibles to chapter 53 of Isaiah. We'll be working out of Isaiah 53 this evening, starting with verse 4. Um, so that's where we're going to start there. Before we get into that, um, let's look at our announcements and then our prayer request. Um, Sunday school, like I say, every Sunday morning at 9 a.m., um, faithful workers class in the sanctuary, all other classes in their classrooms. Um, so just like with Sunday school, same with church. As you come into the church, please be wearing your mask. When you get to your seat, um, then you can take and remove your mask and um, be where you're at. Unless you're not vaccinated, then we're asking that you keep your mask on. Um, like I say, we're still trying to protect everybody from it. We not only have COVID going on, but we also have the flu bug going around along with a few others. I'm getting a flashing and I'm just trying to see if I can get stuff flashing. I think I got it. All right. Um, so like I say, we got that going on. Um, then month of February, we're collecting hats, gloves, scarves, um, for the Christmas shoe boxes. Um, so like I say, we have that going on boxes in the hallway and then also remember the Methodist church. Um, food pantry as we continue to support that um, way of birthdays and anniversaries um, February 26th is my birthday um, so they put that in there just let you know I'm getting a little older and that's fine um, then like I say we had a newlywed couple um, Jack and Mabel Gray happy 62nd anniversary um, like I say wonderful um, they've been blessed to have 62 years of marriage, so like I say, and that is on the 20th, so that was just this past Sunday, so we wish them a happy birthday, or a happy anniversary, excuse me, sorry about that. All right, um, prayer list, um, Joe and Marion Edwards, continue member Joe, um, trying to get his um, weight up and um, need to get nutrition in him, um, so we're praying that he'll have the desire to eat and that he'll start gaining weight and everything. Um, then Ronnie Locklear, Donna and Jordan Floyd, Louise McLean, Mike and Teresa Ivey, Shirley and Hammonds, Danielle Smith, Kenny Jackson, Pearl Jackson, Angie Baxley, Gina White, Carol Powers, Tom Marie Taylor, Jada Clayton, Ashley Baxley, Kim Hewitt, Richard Holbrook, um, Karen Clegg, um, David Warren, Matthew Ward, Kathy Beanie, Michael Davis, Beth Ward, Mac McMorrow, um, Joe Pate, Van Garganis, Diane Townsend, continue member Miss Diane, um, having some tough times. Um, Eugene and Florian Eford, Shannon Britt, Chloe Akers, Junior House, Tamara Overby, Billy McKenzie, Dan Beard, um, Amanda Kane, Linda Cornelius Hunt, the Frisch family, Daryl Britt, Nash White, Judy Clark, Lisa Ray Rodriguez, Bobby Pate, Patsy Butler, Wanda Carter, Kyle Edwards, um, the Supreme Court, um, Ronnie King, William Buddy Scott, um, Deborah Holbrook, Dan Hurley, Sharon Coe, Taylor Fields, Ashley Blanks, Kenny Strickland, the Pulpit Committee, our church, the lost, our nation, its leaders, our troops and their families, and the police officers, and then the pastors and their families. Um, and then let's say um, additional special prayer request. Um, of course, continue Ms. member Miss Pearl, um, Kathy, who is Patsy's sister, remember her. Um, Ms. Elsie Jaron, um, the Smith family, Michael and Teresa Ivy, special prayer for them. Connie, um, found out she has some eye issues, um, looking at possible surgery. Um, that coming up. Winford Wade, <coughs> excuse me. Um, Penny Hagens, um, praise report, um, passed out. Somebody was right there and knew what to do, helped her, and they've got her, her taken care of. So, like I say, just praise it, the right person at the right place at the right time. Um, then also remember Mary and Dan Beard. Um, they were under the weather this past week. Mabel had a doctor's appointment. Um, Doris McLean is recovering from her surgery. Um, initial report I got, surgery went great. Um, just really um, moving along. Um, special prayer for Megan Scott. Um, been on the prayer list um, with cancer. Um, they're saying the cancer throughout the body is having extreme problems with um, some tumors um, in her head that's causing for pressure and eye issues. So remember M Megan, um, David Ivey, um, prayer support. They have three stents in him, but did not have any blood clots. They're looking for blood clots. Um, 
Kendra Locklear um, lost a child. So like I say, remember Kendra. And then Karen gave me this one, um, a young man, um, probably several of you have met him or seen him. Um, works at Food Line and then also works at Walmart. Um, lives down the road, or down from us, so not down exactly from this road, but um, Joshua Patterson passed. And like I say, he's a young man, I think, in his 20s. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but like I say, um, remember that young, that family as they've lost him um, this past week. And so, you good Christian young man. Um, but like I say, he passed. So, I know we have special prayer requests and um, private concerns, um, as we've indicated uh, in our services. Let's definitely keep um, the world on our <laughs> hearts. I mean, everything's going on over in Ukraine. Hoping this thing don't escalate. Um, like I say, we're already getting, um, from what I'm reading, understanding Russia's already into the one section of Ukraine where it's controlled by rebels or whatever they're calling them, um, claiming a separatist state. Um, let's hope this thing does not escalate any further. Um, so like I say, we got that going on. And then like I say, we got other issues around the world. Um, we got troops being deployed or are deployed. We got troops in Poland. We got troops in Germany. We got troops um, ready to move. Um, definitely, you know, different, you know, naval vessels placed strategically around the whole area. It's just a lot of tension rising um, from a lot of different countries. So, like I said, we just need to be in prayer for this whole situation. Also, let's be in prayer for our schools um, and different things coming out. Um, different schools with the mandates, others keep mandates on. A lot of confusion um, concerning masks and whatnot. Um, so, definitely be in prayer for schools. Um, whether it's with a mandate or not mandate, the thing of it is our children need prayers in their schools. And we need to pray for our children because there's a lot of them that's having a rough time and we need to be in prayer for them as much as we can. Um, and then also, um, as I'm now Sunday, um, part of the sermon, we're talking about North Carolina ranking 10th in hunger and one in five children aren't sure they're going to even eat today. Um, so, you know, it's a major issue. And we know and living in Robinson County, Robinson County we're in impoverished county. Uh, that number may be even higher. So, like I say, need to be in prayer for our children. Um, pray for our leaders. Um, like I said, there's just a lot going on, and we just need to be in prayer for it. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Father, there's a lot going on in the world today. There is every day, but it seems like today the tensions are rose. In the country, impairing, impeding upon another, whatever the proper word is here, Lord. And Father, we're just praying for peace. We do not want to see a war escalate and just take root in Europe. Father, we want peace to reside, and we don't want to see innocent people hurt, and already people are being displaced and evacuated, and already things going on over there. And Father, we just pray that. Somehow we can come to a peaceful resolution that no one gets hurt and things are done. And Father, we just pray your blessings upon that area. And Father, we pray your blessings upon the militaries. Young men deployed from all countries. And you know, we, we think about our own country, but all over Europe and Asia and all troops are deployed. And young men and women now, Lord, that are in harm's way. And that they're going to be used as pawns in a game of a bigger game of chess. Father, protect them and keep them. They have families. They have mothers. They have fathers. Lord, and Father, we just pray that you bless them and keep them. No matter what country they're from, keep them safe, Lord. And we pray this thing de-escalates. And Father, we pray for our nation. We pray for our leaders from the top to the bottom that we make the right decision for all leaders, Lord. A lot of times we don't think about praying for other leaders of other nations, but they're all there by your appointment and father we understand that from the scriptures that we used and studied sunday and father they're there and they're there because you put them there and father we just pray for each and every one of them lord that they'll do your will and heed you and seek your wisdom excuse me and father we pray we pray for the salvation of our nation 
The healing of the land, Lord, begins in the hearts and the souls of the men and women and children in this nation. And Father, we pray for the salvation of each and every one. Father, may they hear your call. May they hear the, your voice, Lord. May they feel the tugging at their heart as you move them. And Father, convict them. Father, bless them and draw them near, Lord. That they'll call on you. That we can be a Christian nation. And Father, we pray that it spreads throughout the world. And not to be selfish, but we want it to spread around the world. The greatness of you, Lord that people will be saved for you pray that none be lost and father we pray for the salvation of our leaders from top to bottom and all those that hold offices lord we're talking judges and all the other advisors and all those it's not just elected officials but they all need jesus they all need your wisdom and understanding father bless them and father we pray for our prayer list Father, we have many in your, our prayer list that need your healing touch, that need your strengthening to their bodies, Lord. They're weak and frail, and they need your strength, Lord, and we need you to lift them up and heal their bodies and strengthen them, Lord. Bless them. Pick them up and move them forward, Lord. And Father, we pray also and thank you and give you the glory for those that have recently come through surgeries and procedures and are doing well. Father, many are astounding us with how just successful things are. We, you know, we think about surgeries and the recoveries, but Lord, you've just shown so much of your hand and how wonderful you are in the healing business, Lord. And it's just a wonderful thing to see. And Father, we pray that that healing will continue and that they'll get stronger. And Father, we have others who are searching for answers and have upcoming procedures and tests coming up and father we pray that you'll bless them father you're already there you already know the outcomes you already know all these things for you're ahead of them waiting father bring them through and father just comfort them and guide them as they go through these things and father we pray for the families that have lost loved ones you mentioned a young man that has passed this week and there's others on our prayer list lord and father we pray that you'll just bless those families and Father, there's others within the community that have also passed. And Father, we just pray for comfort. And Father, use the church, no matter where it is, use the church to comfort these people and help them. And Father, bring them through this. It's not just today, it's not tomorrow, but it goes on for a while. Grieving takes time. Father, bless and keep them. And Father, we pray. For our first responders, our firefighters, our police officers, and ambulance and EMS and emergency rooms, all those that are on the front lines. And Father, we're, we're thinking this pandemic is passing and it, numbers have gotten better in many ways, but it's not over. And there's still another variant out there. It's not as aggressive, it's not showing itself as much as the other one, but there's more variants out there. There's more illnesses to come, more deaths possibly and father we pray that the deaths will be spared pray that the illnesses will pass and that we'll get past this pandemic we're praying that it's close to being over lord but only you know and your will has to be done and father bless our church bless us in all that we do let us heed your word let us be studious of it but father beyond the study and beyond the knowing let us apply it and use it that we can be a witness to the community, that we can be part of the community and serve it and lift it up and help them to draw closer to you, Lord. No change will come unless you move. And Father, you're moving through us. That's why you put us here. That's why you gave us a mission. That's why you gave us arms and legs and all the things that we need to carry out your will. Father, use us, guide us, and direct us. Watch over and keep us, and as we study your word this evening, Lord, we pray that it will move within our heart and that we'll understand the forgiveness that we have in Jesus Christ for our sins. Father, for we are guilty of sins. Our sins have been forgiven, but it is not a license to sin that these things have happened, but that we should have a great remorse when we see the suffering, the pain that he went through, and that we should feel bad when we sin, Lord. And that we want to be forgot, forgiven of it. 
and not to commit a sin again. Bless us and guide us, Lord. Bless this Bible study and bless this time. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. All right. Excuse me. Like I say, the silence is a little bit is um, um, draining. Um, so that's giving me a little bit of issues. But it's that time of year. I go through this in the fall and the spring a little bit. And right now we're having springtime weather. There's no doubt about it. Um, 70 degrees um, today when I was outside um, coming home from work. So like I say, a lot going on. Turn in your Bibles and let's look at Isaiah, um, chapter 53. Um, we're continuing the section um, dealing with the servant um, who is the Messiah, the Lord, the Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we're going to pick back up, like I say, in 53. And we're going to start at verse 4. And again, this is the... These verses and the section that we're studying, in, you know, last week and this week and whatnot, are the very core of a lot of prophecy concerning the Messiah um, in the Old Testament. And some of the scriptures, and like I say, I read these, and if I don't realize or I don't think about reading out of Isaiah, I, I look at them and I'm like, wow, these verses are so familiar. And many people would think, well, you know. They're in the New Testament. Well, some of them are quoted in the New Testament, so that's why they sound familiar to us, but they're originally written in Isaiah. Excuse me, but others do that we've heard them so much, and um, they're very familiar to us. Um, some of these verses are almost familiar to us as John 3, 16. I mean, some of them we hear every Easter, and we almost, somebody starts reading a verse, we can complete it. I mean, it's just, and all. So we're going to go through these. Um, Looking at Isaiah, we're going to read verses 4 through 6 out of chapter um, 53. It says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him, stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Again, core verses of the gospel. This is the very root of it. And it's in the Old Testament. That's why Paul could witness to the to the Jews so much. The gospel is right here. He just go to chapter 53 and 52 and 54. And he just start pulling out all these verses about, you know, for salvation and forgiveness and the Messiah and the sacrifice. And he could just start pulling all this out. It's all right here. And this section right here, these few verses and all, really goes back and tells us that the Messiah is the sacrifice that's meeting the requirements of the Levitical law. And that's spelled out in Leviticus 16. For there must be innocent animal sacrifice dying for the guilty sinner. Remember, the this, this sin offering was a requirement. It was a blood requirement. And only here, the sheep that's being led to slaughter was not a physical sheep as in an animal sheep. But it was the sheep, the Son of God, the, the innocent Lamb of God, the Holy Son of God. That is the sacrifice that is here. In 1 Peter 2 and 24, it says, He personally carried the load of our sins in his own body when he died on the cross, so that we can be finished with sin and live a good life from now on. For his wounds have healed ours. It's another translation. It's a living Bible translation, but it spells out very clearly. Jesus bore all our sins. He took them. He carried them with him. It was a load on him. And in bearing that, Jesus took away the eternal punishment for sin from those who believe on him. See, if you don't believe in Jesus, then you're going to face the punishment of sin. But for those who believe in Jesus, the eternal punishment... You know, eternal damnation is gone because that has been taken away. Because he saved us. In the life of Jesus, we also see examples of the healing ministry when we walk. You know, it talks about healing up here, right? By the stripes we were healed. And, all, and we think about the healing ministry of Jesus. You know, he healed Peter's mother. You know, the lame, the deaf, the law. You know, there's all these different ones he healed. So there's a healing ministry of it. And all. But... You know, the true power of his ministry was the death on the cross. Because Jesus walked as a man on this earth, but he went to that cross sinless, innocent. The emphasis inside the verses of 4 through 6 is on the grief and sorrows. And then our iniquities, our transgressions. It's all rolled in there. 
See, God, we did, God didn't go wrong. We went wrong. We went astray. And it says we have went our own way. That's what it's talking about. The people have gone. Everyone turned everyone to his own way. Well, how many people today do we know that say, hey, I'm going to do it my way? Too many people today are walking in their lone light. Thinking, I know what I need to do. I'm going to do it my way. And the further they go down that road, the further they get away from God because they're worshiping their self. They may not think that they're worshiping their self, but when you say, I've got all the answers, I know what to do and all, you're relying on yourself as the one who knows best. Yourself making yourself a God in a sense. How many people do we know like that? And the sad thing is, too many people have even got to the point they don't even notice their own sins. They're doing so many things and doing it the way they think it ought to be, they don't even consider them sins. They convince themselves they're doing okay. We really need to step back and look at the things we do and the things we say and how we go about things. A lot of us are committing sins regularly. But we're thinking it's okay because everybody else does it. You know, it's no big deal. It don't stand out. We just blend in. But a sin's a sin. It says that he was wounded, which means pierced through. His hands, his feet, remember, were pierced by the nails. His side by a spear. He was crucified. Now, crucifixion was not the Jewish way of capital punishment. That was not the Jewish method. The capital punishment in the Jewish law was stoning. They would beat you with us. They would throw stones in, until they killed you. That was the way Jews did capital punishment. No, this is a Roman practice. This is another culture's practice of capital punishment. So the very fact that it's in prophecy and all, and as you go back and you study and read through different things, it really points out that God knew who was going to be in control and who would be killing his son as part of the sacrifice. And now the Jews, like I say, stoning was their way. And if they wanted to further humiliate a victim, what they would do is leave the corpse exposed publicly. Jesus died on that cross publicly. He died on that cross. He was humiliated. He was there for everybody to see him die. Basically stripped naked of his clothes, barely covered, if any. Remember, they took his robe and they cast lots for it and separated it. He was humiliated before all and dying before all in public. On the cross, Jesus was bruised, which means crushed under the weight of a burden. Now, we, we don't think much about this, but we have to put it in perspective. You know, what was the burden? Well, the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that's in Isaiah 53. And six, sin is indeed a burden. A lot of us don't think of sin of a burden, but I will tell you it is a burden. If it doesn't burden you, then you need to really look at yourself that if you can sin and not feel the burden of it. Sin is indeed, it grows heavier the longer we resist God. The more that we resist God, you can read Psalms 38 about that. You know, have you ever had an unsettled sin in your life? Think about it. A lot of people have unsettled sin in their life and they just bury it under emotions. They just bury it and try to forget about it. But an unsettled, unsettled sin in their life, and upon finally settling it and seeking forgiveness, do you feel the weight removed? You ever felt it, the weight of sin just lifted up off of you? A lot of us don't think that way, but when we let sin get into us and fester, it's a disease. And it can cause you a lot of problems. An unsettled sin in your life can cause you a lot of problems. As a result, it can cause us emotional pain from stress and guilt. It can affect us with depression, if not resolved and left un, you know, unresolved long enough. It can even affect our bodies, causing physical illness. And when your body is under stress, when your body is under pressure, it can become physically ill. Sin can do that. It's not just a spiritual thing that affects you, but it can affect you in the physical and the emotional state as well. 
So if you have unresolved sins in your life, you know, you have a burden that you're bearing unnecessarily. You need to seek, re seek resolution to it. You need to seek that forgiveness and get it out because it's bearing you down. It's holding you down. And Satan wants you to be held down. So he wants you, oh, you, you can't be forgiven of that sin. You can't, you know, get out from under that. No, that's what Satan's going to tell you. But Jesus says, bring it to me. I'll forgive you because on that cross, he bore all the sins. Imagine all the sin of the world bearing down upon him. The burden that he carried to that cross. It goes on and it talks about he was chastised and given many stripes and yet that punishment brought us peace and healing. The only way a lawmaker can be at peace with the law is to suffer the punishment the law demands. A lot of people don't like it that way and they don't think about it. But if you break the law, you can look at this in several different ways. If you break the law, Do you ever feel guilty about it? You ever be going down the road and you look down and you realize, oh man, I'm speeding. You look back in the mirror to see if anybody sees, see if there's a police officer coming up behind you or something. You're all of a sudden like, oh, you know. Now some people, don't bother them. Matter of fact, my neighbor said today, you know, police caught a gentleman going 88 miles an hour down our road right in front of our house today. The only reason he knows it because the officer came back and was buying some honey from him and told him <laughs> what he was doing. 88 miles an hour. And he said he was even going faster on the next road down before he caught him. That's breaking the law. And it can affect you if you're conscientious of it. And the only way that a lawbreaker truly finds peace is if he suffers the punishment that the law demands. A lot of us don't like the thought of that, but really, you know, a lot of times we can't have peace until we really get what we deserve. And we feel bad about it. As children, probably, many of us have done this. We knew we did something wrong, and we kept it from our mom and dad, and it bothered us, and it bothered us, and bothered us, and... Almost even when we they finally found out and we got in trouble, it's like, oh, what a relief! Finally, this is over. I don't have to hide it anymore. I don't have to, you know, lie about it anymore. I can, you know, it's over. In a sense, that's sort of what this is saying. Jesus took the stripes. Remember, he he was flogged. He took the whipping that belonged to us. He took our place. And now we can have peace with God and, and not be condemned by the law because we are free from the law for we are forgiven of our sins. We will not go back under the law unless we put ourselves back under the law. And a lot of Christians do this. Do we fail to realize that our sins are forgiven. It does not give us a license to sin. But our sins are forgiven and we should not feel condemned. We should feel remorse when we break the, break, you know, the law or sin however you want to put it. We should feel remorse and, and feel bad and, and seek out the forgiveness and the reconciliation and do the things we need to do. But we cannot feel condemned because we are not condemned. For our sins are forgiven when we believe and are saved, past, present, and future. So we cannot be condemned by our sins anymore. But we can feel guilt. And we can feel the burden of sin when we let it fester and dig within us, when we don't seek out forgiveness. We feel the consequences of sin, absolutely. But we will not be condemned to eternal damnation because of our sin, because we already are saved. We'll answer for that sin, and we should seek to make it right. But we will not be condemned again. We've once condemned, that's it. And now that that's removed... And a lot of Christians allow themselves to feel condemned again. And Satan uses it and hampers them and they're worthless to the kingdom of God because they're so wor they're wallowing in sin that's really not already been forgiven, but they're just not accepting it. And like I say, sin is not only like a burden, it's also a sickness. And we've talked about that. And then sin is serious. Don't take sin lightly. 
The prophet calls it transgression, which means rebellion against God. You get that? Sin is transgression, which is rebellion against God. Daring to cross the line that God's drawn. That's what it's talking about. Now, one of the things I was taught early on, and one of the truest definitions of sin that I was taught, is rebellion against God. It is not simply breaking one of the rules written down in the Bible, the Ten Commandments or whatnot. That's not true. There's a sense, but that is not. There is sin is broader than that. And a lot of people, you know, they'll say, "Well, that's not written in the Bible. It's not a sin." They get in very legalistic. And remember, what happens when we become legalistic? We become like the Pharisees, and we miss the message, and we miss God's forgiveness, and we become legalism. And when we go that, we are so far off base and getting further. No, the rebellion against God comes from many forms than just the rules listed as many people try to put it. If God calls you to the ministry and you say no, you've just sinned because you rebelled against God's will. If God puts people in front of you to witness to and you refuse to witness to them, you've just sinned. Because God's will is that you did that and you rebelled against God. You told him no. A lot of people don't look at that as sin, but it is. It's called sins of omission by not doing it. But it's rebellion just the same when you refuse to do what God asks you to do. I can list all kinds of examples and you can agree with me or not agree with me, but put it in this terms. If you tell a child to do something as a parent, and that child tells you no, what is that child doing? The child's rebelling. You would call that child a rebellious child. In the Bible, it would get so bad. If you had a rebellious child, you could take them before the leaders at the gate of the city and explain to them what's going on, and they would decide if it was sufficient enough, and if it was sufficient enough, they would take the child out and stone it. Or stone them, not it, excuse me. A rebellious child can be stoned. How many of us deserve to be stoned because we're so rebellious to God our Father? He's telling us to do things and leading us to do things, and we stand up and say, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to tell people about you. I'm not going to go and do that to help somebody. I'm not going to, I'm not going to. And that's what we say because we're not comfortable with it. It makes us get out of our box and we don't do it. Anybody in their right mind would not stand up in front of a congregation and teach the Bible. He said, well, some people are called to it. Exactly. And trust me, I know what it is to push against God when he calls you to do something. I've done it. And I learned I didn't want to do it again. When God calls you to do something, tells you to do it, don't fight him. Because it's going to get worse. Until the point that you become so rebellious, God says, fine. And he leaves you in your ways. Then where are you at? You're not listening to God, so how can he help you? You've pushed him away some more much. You've stuck your fingers in your ear saying, I'm not listening to you. How can you hear God? How can God help you if you're rebelling and pushing him away constantly? And that's exactly what happens to a lot of people. They're getting so bound in their sin, and that's what's happening to so many churches and so many people, and why the church is ineffective, because too many people are rebelling against God. If they weren't, churches would be a different place. Isaiah also calls sin iniquity, which refers to the crooked, the crookedness of our sinful nature. In other words, we are sinners by choice and by nature. Like sheep, we are born with the nature that prompts us to go astray. Sheep, you know, like sheep, we foolishly decide to go our own way. Why do you think they had to have shepherds? Because sheep would wander off. There's a natural tendency to stay in a group, but then some of them, they just wander off. How many Christians have just wandered off from the flock? How many Christians have just wandered off and said, I'm going to go my own way and do my thing? 
Ephesians 2 and 3 tells us by nature we are born the children of wrath. And by choice we become children of disobedience. Look at how we are. Our nature is contrary to God because of sin. Under the law of Moses, and that's how they refer to the Old Testament law, right? The law of Moses, he gave it to them. The sheep died for the shepherd. You have to think about that one. Think about this for a minute. If the shepherd sinned, then a blood offering would be required, and he would bring an offering of a sheep, right? So the sheep died for the shepherd. But under grace of God, the good shepherd died for the sheep. Jesus is our shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And he died for the sheep. All right, let's move on. I'm going to get hung up and I'll stay there too long. Next set of verses, it's verses 7 through 9. It says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his sheep her shears is dumb so he openeth not his mouth he was taken from prison and from judgment and who shall declare this his generation for he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people was he stricken and he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth now take back and look at it think about the crucifixion think about the events leading up to it Think about what happened in all this and start seeing the image here, right? The servant is not permitted to talk back. A servant is not allowed to talk back to the masters. If a servant talked back to their master, what would happen to them? They could be punished. They could be killed. It'd be up to the master or what the punishment was. He or she must submit to the will of the master or the mistress. Jesus was silent before his accusers. He did not lift up his voice in his own defense. He remained silent. He was silent before Caiaphas, the chief priests and the elders, Pilate, and all. And Herod and Antipas. He did not speak when the soldiers mocked him and beat him. He kept silent. It is this when the Ethiopian treasurer reads Isaiah over in Acts 8 and 26. It is this silence that is impressed by it. It's like, why? Isaiah 53 and 7 speaks of his silence under suffering. How many of us can be silent when we're suffering? He was silent when he was illegally tried and condemned to death. There is no fair trial for Jesus. This is, a, this is what we call a you know, railroad. There is no fair trial. It was not done the way it was supposed to be done. In today's courts, a person can be found guilty of terrible crimes, but it can be proved that something in the trial was illegal. The case just has to be tried again. There was none of that with Jesus' trial. They brought false witnesses. They brought people up to say things that were false. Why? Because they weren't even dead. They couldn't stand looking at him. Because if you look at Jesus, you realize how far you are from the mark. How far you are from where you're supposed to be. And that in itself will make you feel guilty and hurt and unworthy. The servant in these verses is compared to a lamb, one that is frequent symbols of the Savior. We see that the lamb, you know, is used repeatedly in throughout the Jewish symbolism and whatnot. And even, even at the Passover, what did they do? They killed a lamb at the Jewish Passover for each household. Here the servant died for his people, the nation of Israel. Here the lamb is dying not for a household, but for the entire nation. And uh, we also see Jesus referred to the lamb 28 times in the book of Revelation and we see it what it says the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John 1 and 29 
we see constantly this reference to Jesus being the lamb, the sacrifice, the pure, to take away the sins. Now remember, at crucifixion, who was Jesus crucified with? Remember, I told you, remember the imagery here, right? He was crucified as a criminal among criminals. And so it was logical that what would happen, especially with the Romans, they didn't care. They would leave you to be an example. They'd leave you hanging there to be an example. And he took. And so here he is, a criminal among criminals, right? He would have probably been left unburied. Remember the Romans, they lined the roads with the dead of those that were against Rome and against their laws. And they'd leave them hang and rot on the crosses. But here, what happens? He was he was hung among the criminals, so he should have been left. But instead, he was buried. And the burial is proof that he actually died. Because the Romans weren't going to take you off that cross and you're dead. They were masters of death in life. They knew how far they could push you before they die. And that's why before they took him off the cross, what did they do? They pierced his side with a spear up onto the chest cavity so that what flowed out? Water and blood. The chest cavity under in his death had begun filling up with water around the heart. And that's what they punctured and that's what came out. Proof that he was dead. Jesus was indeed dead, not asleep as some theorist and all this or some, you know, no. And even, like I say, he was dead. Now, think about where he was buried. The Roman authorities released Jesus' body over to who? Joseph and Nicodemus. They wouldn't have done that unless he was dead. And then, like I say, Joseph of Arimathea was a wealthy man. He would never carved out of a tomb so close to a place of execution. So, you know, his was probably home away. He prepared it. Jesus and spices. And, yeah, they took him to a tomb nearby. And they buried him in a tomb that was never used. Tombs were not cheap. They were just holes in the ground. These, you know, if it was a carved out tomb, it was, a, it was expensive. But he would be buried there. All this, look at this, what happened to Jesus and how that fits the prophecy that we just read. Moving on. Verses 10 through 12. It says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Again, we're talking about the righteous servant, who? Jesus Christ. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his so unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Again, what we see in here, the prophet now explains at the cross from God's point of view. We just looked at it from what we saw and what we study, and now look at it from the God's point of view. Even though Jesus was crucified by hands of the wicked men, his death was determined beforehand. This is the plan. This wasn't something that just happened. This was the plan from beforehand. How else will God have prophesied it back in Isaiah? Unless it was the plan from the start. Jesus was not a martyr. Nor was his death an accident. He was God's sacrifice for the sins of the world. Don't let anybody ever try to you know, muddle it down and say, well, he, you know, he was a martyr. No, he was not a martyr. A lot of people say, well, he died a martyr's death. He was not a martyr. He was the sacrifice for the world. The flip to this is it said he did not remain dead. We know he did not remain dead. That's what it talks about. He shall prolong his days. That's what's listed in 53. It means that the servant was resurrected to live forever. In his resurrection he triumphed over every enemy and claimed the spoils of victory. That's what's explained over in Ephesians. Satan offered Christ a glorious kingdom if he would return to worship. But you know, that meant bypassing cross. Jesus is obedient to death 
and God highly exalted him. And what will Jesus have? His kingdom. Jesus will be ruler of all. He will be the king of kings, lord of lords. That's what is going to be his. Satan offered him something less. Satan's going to always offer you something less than what God can give you. See, he says, I'll give you the world. Jesus, you can't give me the world. I'm going to be the king of kings. I'm going to have it in all. Jesus is going to rule the earth. He's going to have his kingdom on earth, but he's also the king of all. God has something much greater for Jesus. And Jesus wouldn't have to bow down to anybody, especially not Satan, to get it. No, God's plan was for Jesus to rise up and to sit on the throne. Another part of his reward is found in the statement, he shall see his seed, descendants. To die childless was grief and shame to the Jews, but Jesus gave birth to a spiritual family because of his travail on the cross. We are co-heirs with Christ, but we are the God's children. Christ has a spiritual family. The servant's work on the cross brought satisfaction to God. It satisfied the heart of the Father. He did not want to see it. He didn't want to see the suffering. But it fulfilled the plan. Jesus talked about, I do always those things that please him. That's in John chapter 8 and 29. He says, I do the things that please my Father. How many of us will say that? I do all things to please my Father. Not my earthly Father, but my heavenly Father. Is everything you're doing pleasing to the Father? Obviously, God did not want to see his son suffer. He knew it was painful. He, he understood. He created us. He knows what that pain means. He put the pain sensation in our bodies. God understands what pain is. But he knew it had to go through and be endured. But he also pleased his son's obedience to accomplish it. And then remember what Jesus said. When it was done, he said, it is finished. He knew when the plan was complete. The death of the servant satisfied the law of God. A lot of times we don't tie all that together, but it completed the law. The fancy term that we hear for it is propitiation. In the pagan religions, they used that word and it meant to offer sacrifice to placate an angry God or to please the angry gods. But the Christian meaning is much richer. God is angry at sin, not the servant. God can't have sin in his presence. The servant he wanted in his presence. It is the sin that offends the father, not the sinner. And he wants the servant, he wants the sinner to be with him, but he can't with the sin, so the sin had to be done away with. He wants that forgiveness. And so for that, there had to be a sacrifice, and Jesus was that sacrifice. Jesus is going to be the judge, right? But in this case, the judge took the place of the criminals. And uh, he met the demands of the holy law himself as the sacrifice. It says he was numbered with the transgressors. And he even prayed for him. Remember, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He told him you'd be all right. In the death and the crucifixion and resurrection, all the elements... Fulfill the law of God. God justly can rule. And that's why we can have forgiveness because the sin has been paid for. The sin is the sacrifice has been made, right? The price has been paid for the sin. We are saved by grace. Justice can only condemn the wicked. 
and justify the righteous. But grace justifies the ungodly when they trust Jesus Christ. Grace, forgiveness, redemption, propitiation, all that's here. He took our sins that we can receive the gift of his righteousness. Justification means that God declares the believing sinners righteous. We are justified so that we can go before the Father. That's why we don't need a mediator. We're, in God's eyes, we are sinless because Jesus has taken away the sins. We can come before him righteous. Not the righteousness of ourselves, but the righteousness that Jesus put upon us. See, we can never say that I can go to God because of something I've done. Because I can't. I can't go before the Father for anything of myself. But because of Jesus, I can go before the Father. Think about those things. Meditate on. See, that's why it's so important for us to know Jesus is our Savior. So important for us to understand what true forgiveness is. But we'll never appreciate true forgiveness until we recognize what true sin is. How can you recognize forgiveness if you don't know what you did wrong? We need to strive not to sin. We need to strive not to rebel against God. He's called us. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his body. We are to go into this world and we are to proclaim the gospel. We are to you know, carry out the great commission. And we don't sit there and say no. By not doing the great commission, we're being rebellious to God. By not ministering to those in need, we're being rebellious to God. By not speaking the name of Jesus, we're being rebellious to God. All of that is sin. And all of that separates us from God. Because it's undealt with sin if we keep doing, doing it day in and day out and we do nothing about it then what we're having is undealt with sin in our lives and it's separating us from God because we're pushing God away with our sin. We're not being remorseful when we're rebelling against God. We're not saying. That's why the church needs to get up and move individually and as a body to make an impact for Jesus. We can't keep sinning and thinking we're righteous. They don't go together. Let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. And Father, these verses that we're reading and studying all, they're right there at the core of the gospel. And when we sit down and we study the powerful meaning of it, the greatness of what Jesus did when he died on that cross for us, Lord, it will impact our lives. When we truly realize what sin is, I pray we feel a great remorse and strive to sin no more. Father, don't give up on us. Keep using us and moving us and putting in front of us those things you'd have us to do that we'll move forward and do your will and not sin by telling you no. Father, lead us and guide us. Keep us and bring us back together again. And Father, may we increase as we bring others with us and fulfill your will in our daily lives. For it's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless and have a good night.